started promptly. Uh, it's my pleasure to do the introduction for Mr. Tim Markajan. Uh, Tim is with the Joint Commission. Uh, he'll be doing a virtual presentation. We did the same thing in Southern California, uh, and uh, we had lots of opportunity at the end for questions. So please take your notes and be able to be ready to uh, ask Tim lots of questions. It's uh, these opportunities that uh, you, especially virtually, you can be anonymous and ask the Joint Commission your little dirty secrets or the questions you have that uh, you wouldn't be able to do uh, it, you know, face to face. So Tim Markajan uh, is the uh, field director in the hospital program for the Life Safety Code Surveyors at the Joint Commission. In this role, he oversees half, approximately 40 of the surveyor um, of the surveyor group who specialize in surveying the Joint Commission's life safety, environment of care, and emergency management standards. Mr. Markajan was previously a Joint Commission surveyor from 2011 to 2016, surveying the standards in the accreditation manual for hospitals, critical access hospitals, and ambulatory care, healthcare. In this role, he performed initial, triannual, MedDef, follow-up, ICM, OQPS, critical access, and ambulatory surveys. Mr. Mark and John also served on the Joint Commission Survey Advisor Committee from 2012-2015, working on items that relate to customer satisfaction, process improvement, and survey and surveyor efficiency. So if you definitely have questions there, he's the right guy to ask. If you didn't like your surveyor or have questions about him. Uh, prior to joining the Prior to joining the Joint Commission full-time in 2016 as a field director, Mr. Marco John worked for 25 years in the engineering and construction industry. He has been at the director level in healthcare for more than a decade of a, for a 500-bed academic healthcare um, system in Pennsylvania, an 800-bed trauma center and children's hospital in South Florida, and a 200-bed community hospital in North Carolina, and most recently with a five-hospital uh, academic healthcare system in Columbia, Missouri. He has experience managing healthcare engineering, design and construction, environmental services, and clinical engineering. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Markajan. Tim, you there? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I want to just start off by thanking um, the CC board and all those involved with putting together this conference. I'm really honored and privileged to have this time with you today. And as Dave mentioned, we're gonna have plenty of time at the end for um, questions and uh, hopefully answers. Um, I always tell folks that um, I don't know everything. I don't memorize everything. Uh, if I don't know it, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, hey, I'll get you that answer and get back to you. I, I'm one of those ones, I don't believe in uh, what we call podium policy. So we'll get you the answer. Um, yeah, this is interesting. I'm. I can't figure out, is this live virtually or virtually live, but um, it's really cool. We can uh, do a lot more presentations this way and reach out to a lot more of the, um, you know, um, state associations for healthcare engineering this way. So I appreciate this opportunity. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started um, and talk about updates. Uh, so, and a lot of this information, sort of, I shouldn't say a lot, some of this information you may already know, you know, with the pandemic, we had a little bit of a, a lull in survey activity. So some folks are uh, past due for survey. Uh, some folks have had surveys recently. But, so I just got to cover information that you may or may not know. But um, we did retire our formal environment of care session. That was usually um, a sit down session for about an hour where, you know, we would go through um, the, the management plans and, and a lot of different activities there. But uh, because of the voice of the customer, the customer said, hey, uh, we're not getting a, we're really not getting a lot a lot out of that session. We'd like to try to do it a different way. And so the Joint Commission uh, taken uh, customer feedback. What we did was we, we still survey the same information. It's just in a different way instead of a sit down session. So we've expanded our document review session to include items that we would have done during the uh, sit down session. So we'll get into clinical engineering uh, maintenance uh, logs. We'll get into your management plans. We'll get into your water management plan, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. 
a lot of those things we would have did during that uh, sit down session. Now we're doing it uh, day one in the morning of the document review session, but that's only one piece of it. The second piece of it is, well, pieces two and three are the life safety code surveyors and the clinical surveyors. Uh, when they're out in the facility touring, they are um, surveying those items that they would have done maybe during the environment of care session. So if we're walking through radiology, we might talk to the folks about um, their lead management plan and you know how they ensure the safety and testing of lead uh, or you know those kind of activities. We're going to talk to folks on the floor about workplace violence or of course uh, race and past and those things. So we're kind of taking um, that environment of care session and, and taking it on the road, so to speak, the road being out in the, in the units in the hospital. Offsite surveys, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, now this is um, hospital program offsite surveys. So we had a change to what we call our business rules uh, recently. Um, in the past, we would send on a hospital survey, if we had an ambulatory surgery center or we had freestanding EDs, or we had sites that had inpatient behavioral health you know, off campus from a hospital, in the past, clinical surveyors would have surveyed that physical environment. So recently, uh, what we did to enhance uh, the survey process and the safety, really it's all about the safety, is we wanted the experts in physical environment to go to those areas, ASCs, freestanding EDs, inpatient behavioral health. So what we're doing now is on a hospital survey, the life safety code surveyor goes to those sites and we add one day for each one of those types of sites. And so, you know, you, if you have those kind of sites off campus from a hospital and they fall under the hospital um, HCO number, Joint Commission HCO number, you can expect the life safety code surveyor now to go to those sites and do the same thing you would do at a hospital, just shorter amount of time because it's a smaller building, okay? So just be aware of how we're doing those offsite facilities now with life safety code surveyors. All right, emergency management. Uh, wow, we've, we've really overhauled and renovated the emergency management chapter uh, this year for just for the hospital and critical access programs. We have 22 new EPs and 38 revised EPs. Um, but luckily we've streamlined 124 uh, EPs down to just 60. So we've reduced a lot. We've created a couple, we've created new ones. We've revised it, but we've also streamlined and reduced a lot of EPs. 49 out of 60 EPs require a written documentation, which equates to about 82%. Uh, so be aware of that. And um, the implementation has already happened. It happened on July 1st, 2022. Um, but again, underline uh, the fact that this is a hospital and critical access programs. We, we, we have uh, emergency management chapter and standards for a lot of other programs, but this, what I'm talking to you about right now is just for the hospital and critical access. All right, here's a, a table of our new structure. So if you were to look at the EM chapter uh, at the beginning of uh, 2022, we would have started out at EM 010101 and worked up from there. And what we did is we, because those other programs still have, um, you know, the current or the old, I should say that way, the old EM structure in place in those other programs, we built the hospital critical access on top of those. And so these are the different um, uh, standards, if you will. So the emergency management program at not EM 911, emergency management leadership at EM 1011, and so on and so forth. You can see the listing here. And I'm gonna go through um, those, the, the overall standard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you those uh, now, and then you can go ahead and look at those in your manuals if you haven't already. So the new EM 911 requirements, it requires the development of an emergency management program, integrated and unified EM programs, following applicable law and regulation and transport, uh, transplant programs. EM 1011 requirements, 
They require leadership to provide oversight and support, a qualified EM program lead, multidisciplinary committee to develop and maintain the EM program. At EM 110101 requires conducting an HVA, all hazards comprehensive analysis, evaluating and prioritize findings to implement mitigation and preparedness activities. That's really not new. You guys have been doing that uh, for, for a very long time. EM 1211 requires written all hazards is EOP with policies and procedures, identify patient populations, shelter in place versus evacuate, incident command structure, we identify primary and alternate IC sites, cooperating and collaborating 1135 waiver process. And uh, EM 1221 requirements address the six critical areas, communication, staffing, patient clinical support, safety and security, resources and assets, and also utilities. Uh, EM 1311 requires written continuity of operations plan, how well, or I'm sorry, how and where will continue to provide essential business functions, succession plan, and delegation authority. I would point out that um, this particular standard with the COOP having um, succession plan and delegations of authority, right now, this, uh, this is one standard that I see uh, frequently scored. Uh, I don't have the data to show you right now, but from direct survey observations I've done in the field, this is one you're going to want to go back and make sure you have uh, nailed down really tight because a lot of places I'm going to, I'm seeing uh, this is a, a frequent standard scored. EM 1411 requires written disaster recovery plan, family unif reunification and coordinating with local community partners. EM 1511 requires written EM education and training program, initial and ongoing, defines topics to cover and frequency of training, incident command, staff education and training. That, that's another one I would highlight for you is incident command, staff education and training. Um, make sure that that's um, accessible and available during survey. All right, and wrapping up here with uh, these EM standards, uh, EM 1611 requires a written plan for conducting two exercises per year. Accredited freestanding outpatient care buildings conduct one exercise per year. And EM 1711 requires multidisciplinary committee reviews and evaluates all exercises in actual emergencies identify opportunities for improvement and recommended actions, and then sent to senior leadership for review, reviews um, and updates every two years or more frequently. This is another one. I think this, this would be the third one that I would point out to you is, um, I think everybody has down pat, you know, how many events, how many exercises or real events need to be uh, done per year, but making sure that that evaluation is documented and identifying opportunities for improvement and recommend, re recommended actions. Those are areas I, I often see organizations um, just making sure their, their documentation is in order. Here's a reference guide for us to use um, that has the new uh, EM standards, the EP uh, area. Uh, so this is a really nice little maybe a cover page for your, your documentation or whatever, but really it's, uh, it's the same for critical access in the hospital, except for that EM 911. But it also has a little at the far right, a cross reference uh, table there to tell you, um, you know, where they were at the you know, prior or older EM standards. So this might be a tool that's helpful for you. But online, um, Joint Commission, there's a, we have an emergency management web page and, um, I'll, I'll have to get you the link because in this presentation, well, when you get the presentation, that blue Joint Commission EM webpage is actually a hyperlink that will take you um, to these two different sites. But just wanted to point out that we have an EM webpage uh, for you to go.
go to and reference and study and learn from. And there are tools there that uh, might be very useful for you. And then of course, um, uh, over at JCR, they have uh, an, you know, a, a nice um, book, if you will, that um, helps as well with emergency management. So that's emergency management, healthcare, all hazards approach, the fifth edition. So, all right, let's get into survey preparation and documentation, uh, things, uh, what, you, what to expect and what you should do. And um, the number one thing, you know, we're doing um, document review session. We're doing that on day one. We're doing it right after the opening conference. So we're going to do that opening conference at 9 a.m. local time. Usually by about 930, we're with the facilities and safety folks and a scribe and we're headed to go do document review. And, you know, this is kind of the, the, the tips to success, you know, how to be successful for this document review session. You know, the number one thing is being organized. Um, when I did the uh, Southern California uh, presentation last month, they asked me, does it matter if, it's, if the documentation is paper or electronic? And I told them uh, the same as I'll tell you, we don't require, we don't have a preference. Uh, we can do it paper, we can do it electronic. What I've seen 95% uh, of the time is when folks try to do it electronic, they, being able to retrieve the information in a timely manner has been very difficult for folks. Uh, so if you're gonna go electronic, um, make sure you can you know, retrieve the documentation um, quickly and you know where it's at. But being organized is the trick. Um, I, I would tell you the best organizations that get through this session, this two hour session with little or no observations, uh, they are the ones who set up their binders and their tabs and then they, then they sub tab it you know, following our document review checklist. I'm gonna show you that on the next slide, but um, our document review checklist is available to you all in our surveyor activity guide. So if you don't know where to find that, get with your quality or your accreditation folks and um, say, hey, I heard the Joint Commission uh, gives us a document review checklist, set up your binders um, in order uh, by, that, by that document review checklist. We also give you in that survey activity guide uh, another tool that we use, it's called the Kitchen Tracer Checklist. So get a hold of that and use, use both of those during your mock survey. So the next step here is um, complete, you know, complete the documentation. And what, what I mean by that is, you know, if you have a, a device that fails during testing, maybe it's a smoke detector or a pull station. If something fails during that, we, and we expect to see failures, we you know, our, our spidey sense goes up when we see everything's perfect in all your, you know, like nobody's perfect 100% of the time. Um, we expect to see failures. And what, what the string we're going to pull on is, if you have a failure, can you show us documentation that you repaired it or replaced it? And then can you show documentation that you retested it? So basically, don't, don't give a surveyor that little hanging string to pull on um, to, to ask you more and more questions. Um, and then lastly, you know, studying and understanding and knowing um, the standards and the elements of performance within the document review session um, and in all of our ECLS and EM standards, you know, become familiar with them. But I would share with you, you'd be surprised how many organizations we go to and their facilities management folks uh, don't have an electronic or paper copy of the standards. So um, on yourself, like you have your life safety code or NFPA 99, make sure you have a copy of the Joint Commission standards and EPs if you're accredited by the Joint Commission. This is just a screenshot of our document review checklist that I was just talking about. Uh, and this is at the beginning, this is page one. And what we train our surveyors to do is to go to, and we actually grade them on this. And when we're doing, when Jim Kendig and I were the two that manage all the life safety code surveyors, when we go out and observe them, uh, and oh, by the way, I'll take a little sidestep here for a second. We observe half of our surveyors every year. Uh, so we're out there, you know, with them very frequently, making sure that um, they're following the survey process. 
Um, but what we do is we expect to see them use this document review checklist. We expect them to go in in order and we, we expect them not to skip EPs and or skip an EP and go backwards. And so, you, you know, if you get the document review checklist from the survey activity guide, you basically have the test. We're just making sure that you have what's on the sheet, sheet here. You can see that we have, uh, we've developed columns there in the uh, far left there where it says there's a C, an NC, an NA, an IOU. That's where the surveyors can write, is this EP compliant, not compliant, it doesn't apply, or the organization needs an IOU. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about IOUs in a little bit uh, because we, we definitely use IOUs in our survey process. But that's what those um, columns mean. And in the far right, this is where they're gonna document the testing dates so that they can keep track of when things were done and you know, um, so that they can look over, not just was it compliant, but is it, um, was it done on time, right? So this is just uh, uh, going into uh, page two, where you get into EC235 and all your fire uh, extinguishing and suppression and detection notification devices and all that uh, is in the EC235. Uh, like I said, uh, that document review checklist, it's 14 pages long. That's front and back. So uh, there's a lot of stuff to get through. And, um, you know, we do our best to cover as much as we can. I want to point out that uh, EC235, um, EP28, um, talks about what we require in the documentation. Um, so so for, e, for all the elements of performance, EC235, EPs 1 through 20 and 25, the reason why I'm showing this to you is because this is a common issue where organizations um, don't have all of this information on their document. So the name of the activity, the date of the activity, the inventory of devices, equipment, and other items, the required frequency, of the activity, the name and contact information of the person who did the testing, the NFPA standards um, and results of the activity. I would say the number one thing that uh, sometimes is missing is probably the uh, NFPA standards are there, but that they're the wrong years. Um, and a lot of times what will happen is some organizations are required you know, to show their local AHJ, maybe it's Oshpot or, or your local fire marshal, you might be required to show them a more current NFPA 25 testing document. Whereas for the Joint Commission and CMS, uh, we have ours is based off the 2012 Life Safety Code and the reference codes for the Life Safety Code. So keep that in mind. Um, it's unfortunate if your local folks require one and we require another, you just got to have, um, you got to have double really. Uh, another important fact I'll, I'll share with you is this documentation uh, requirements, these items here, they're only required for EC235, EPs 1 through 20 and 25. And um, so, you know, when you get into EC257, for example, with generators and ATSs and battery backup lights and exit signs and all that, this is, doesn't pertain to that standard. It only pertains to 235. Um, so keep those surveyors straight if they're asking for that. I mean, I'd say it's a best practice to have it there, but we wouldn't cite you if you didn't have it on a different standard. So if you're within the survey window, what is that? Well, right now with the public health emergency and the pandemic, that's, you know, that's a big fuzzy gray area right now. What it used to mean is the, the survey window was, you know, uh, nine months before your last, you know, your triennial date and, you know, you know, some months after. And so I would still go with that. I mean, if you're beyond the date that you were, um, you know, your triennial date, if you're beyond that, this is what you need to do. Um, but if you're like six months away from your date, you're going to want to review doc, you're going to want to do mock, uh, mock document review uh, yourself with our checklist. Um, you know, reach out to the vendors and get everything in order. Make sure that, you know, they've sent you everything you need to have. Um, 
make sure that your staff have knowledge of what is required and how to access. You know, don't don't have one person in your organization that knows everything. Um, you know, I would have N plus two at a minimum, you know, maybe N, N plus three if, you know, let, let some of your junior people, maybe what you do, what I see some really best practices is they might have um, one of their, their technicians do EC235. They'll bring in their electrician to, to, to do 257. Maybe the, the plumbing supervisor that oversees medical gases, he'll handle 259. So getting more people involved uh, in that document review session, that's just good succession planning and, and taking the pressure off of that one person. So earlier I mentioned IOUs. Um, so uh, it says a surveyor may issue an IOU for, for documentation that is not readily available when asked. I probably should remove that um, word may because they're, they're going to, you know, if you don't have it readily available, they're going to say, hey, that's something you owe it. You owe it to me. Um, so, you know, there's no um, exact time frame. Typically what you're going to here is, hey, you know, have it to me by the end of this day, the first day, or have it to me by lunch on the second day. Uh, you know, they want to give you as much time as they can for you to um, provide the documentation. But on the other hand, they have a report to write, you know, in, the, in uh, day two, if it's a two day survey, you know, they got to get working on that report. So they're going to issue you IOUs um, as much as they can. Um, after survey, you guys are familiar with the clarification process where if you feel like the surveyor um, doesn't under, understand uh, the standard or a, a code requirement, there's that 10 day clarification period after you get your preliminary report. Um, just keep in mind, anything that's document related, like you know, anything that's a document related EP, those cannot be clarified. So the surveyor's observation when they leave stands, there's no clarification. So um, you wanna make sure you get all those um, loose ends tied up before they leave. All right, well, let's talk about some new standards and EPs. First one is uh, EC211 EP17. I'm not gonna bore you with reading um, all of this to you, but it's basically, um, uh, you know, the hospital conducts an annual workplace analysis related to workplace violence. So the Joint Commission this year, uh, this is one of our, you know, EM was a big undertaking. Uh, workplace violence is, it was another a big area for us. Water management was another big one for us. So workplace violence is, um, you know, uh, an item that the Joint Commission is really taken seriously. And it's long overdue. I think you all know that and, and agree with that, that, um, you know, we really need to protect each other and, and our staff in these, in our work environment. So take a look at uh, EC211 EP17, um, added a new requirement that hospitals conduct an annual workplace analysis, uh, just as I mentioned. All right, I'm gonna get into uh, my slides for water management uh, standard that um, we started surveying this year. And before I get into the new standard, I wanted to give you a, a, a view of the historical view of um, observations for water management. So prior to July of this year, we were scoring water management, um, you know, waterborne pathogen issues at EC251, EP14. And this is the data from 2017 to 2021. I just wanted to, I put this together actually for the ASHI conference this year. I wanted to kind of give people like a historical view of like a, how big an issue is this on survey over the years. And um, there you can see for the five years I'm sharing the number of um, full surveys we've done in the hospital program in those years. I guess you can tell which year was the pandemic with 569 surveys. We're do normally doing between 14 and 1500 um, just hospital full, full hospital surveys. So uh, overall, pretty low number of water management um, observations or deficiencies. You know, uh, when we first started in 17, it was really low. We were coming up to speed 
But I would say on average, we were probably, if you averaged out those five years, maybe around 4%, it would be probably an average. On, so that would, that would mean on 4% of our surveys, there would be a, an observation at EC251 EP14. So that give you give you kind of a, a, a level playing field of before the new standard. So we created a new standard um, and it's EC252. EPs one through four, and there's a lot of text in there. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to do for, for my audiences is kind of boil it down, give you the cliff notes of what each EP uh, really requires. And you can go back and study the EPs to get uh, you know, further information. But EP one, this would be a new requirement that wasn't in 251. So this is saying that we need to have an individual or team accountability of the water management program. So that's new. We didn't have that before. And uh, so that's just identifying, okay, who's responsible for this water management program? Um, EP2, uh, some of this is new. Some of it was existing, but you know, we, we need to have a basic diagram or schematic of your water system. Um, you got to have a risk management plan, a stagnant system or water um, analysis or plan, and monitoring protocols and ranges. So what's new is the basic diagram and stagnant water, the risk assessment and monitoring protocols and ranges. We've had that for the last five years or so. EP3, um, documenting monitoring ranges, corrective actions if there's problems and documenting corrective actions. You notice in here, you don't see any requirements for testing. We don't require testing. CMS doesn't request require testing. What we require is monitoring. Um, and that might be monitoring temperature. That might be monitoring pH, residual chlorine, um, whatever the items that you and your vendor, if you're using a vendor, feel um, helps best protect your vulnerable patients, um, that's what we go by. But I can tell you, when I go out and uh, review reports and review and observe surveys, the problem I see at, on EP3 is they have a beautiful plan. They got someone identified to monitor it uh, or manage it. They have all the, um, you know, the documentation of what, the monitor, what they're going to monitor and what the ranges are. Uh, but believe it or not, I'm what you'll see sometimes is people aren't actually logging or documenting. They're not actually writing down, you know, what the, what the, what they're monitoring. And so you'll have these beautiful binders that, you know, they spent a lot of money on water management plans, but nobody's actually writing anything down. Um, so, um, you know, keep an eye on that as well. And then finally at EP4 maintenance of the program and risk assessment, right? We got to, we got to look at it, uh, the plan, um, on whatever basis you feel is, you know, basis meaning frequency, whatever frequency you you deem necessary. And then looking at this is this is new, new equipment or at risk systems. So, if you are adding equipment to your water system, or um, maybe I, I, an example of an at risk system would be maybe during the public health emergency pandemic you've closed a unit uh, and it hasn't been used and that water is uh, not being used. Or maybe you have a good flushing program, um, but we wanna, we wanna make sure that we see you have uh, a procedure to handle those at-risk systems. And then finally, I'm gonna share some documentation with you since we, or some data, uh, since we started the new EP, the new standard in EP. So, this is for the first six months of 2022. And what I did was I broke it down by EP so you could see where folks are having the most um, difficulty in complying with the EPs. The biggest thing that jumps out at you is the number or the percentage of surveys that have water management um, deficiencies. It's about two and a half times what it was with the old standard in EP. So I told you a few minutes ago, we were at about 4% of the surveys had a water management observation. Now this year, we're at about 10.2%. And um, EPs uh, two 
is the most frequently scored EP in that standard, EP3 being the second most. And then this is um, how those observations land on the safer matrix. Um, you know, you can see the distribution by risk and the yellow is low risk. The yellow into the orange is moderate risk. And then the red is your higher risk um, observations. Um, and I wanted to provide, you know, what are the common observations under each of those EPs. So EP1, no documented plan. They just don't have a plan. Um, organization did not have a diagram mapping supply sources. That would fall under EP2. Uh, and then a team responsible for managing the plan was not, uh, was not documenting any results. That's what I mentioned a few minutes ago. And then we have a, a, a graphical depiction of the water management program and kind of the flow the flow diagram of you know what to do first uh, so you know establishing a water management team and then describing the water systems using text and flow diagrams and so on and so forth and um, you know this is a really useful tool along with this here this is a sample this is a very good sample um, from the cdc toolkit both of these documents are from the cdc toolkit we're not i want to emphasize we're not looking for you know, intricate, um, you know, diagrams of your water system. This is, you know, this is sufficient. This is something that we regularly see in organizations. You can always do more. I just don't want you to feel like you have to do, you know, these, these really complex um, drawings for your water system. And a tool, a question that we get asked uh, regularly is, you know, what buildings do I need to include in the water management program? This tool from the um, toolkit helps you walk through uh, with some basic questions to help you, real, you know, figure out which buildings need to be in in your water management plan. But uh, kind of in closing, um, you know, CDC says, you know, you know, nine in ten of the CDC investigations show almost all outbreaks were caused by problems preventable with more effective water management. And when you look at the uh, mortality rate, I don't know if you've ever looked at the mortality rate of someone acquiring, uh, you know, Legionnaire's disease in a healthcare environment. So if you have a patient in the hospital and they acquire this condition, the mortality rate is like 25%. So it's, you know, somewhere around there. So it's very, very risky and deadly sharing some information where you can go and get some articles and more information uh, on this topic before I move on is uh, our environmental care news. Uh, the September 2017, we did a, another article in 2019, February 2019, October 2019. So we've written a lot of articles about water management. And then of course, you got ASHRAE 188, you got the CDC, um, uh, resource document there. And then, um, you know, ANSI ASHRAE guideline 12-2020. Uh, so lots of helpful information out there. We're still in the kind of in the new standards and EP section. So this is uh, EC411 EP1. Uh, the hospital establishes a process for continuing, continually monitoring, internally reporting and investigating the following. It, injuries to patients and others within the hospital facility, occupational illness and staff injuries, incidents of damage to its property or the property of others, and so on and so forth. At the bottom there, utility systems management problems, uh, failures or use errors. That's an interesting one, user errors. Um, and then note to review of incident reports or often, requir often requires that legal processes be followed to preserve confidentiality. EC411 EP6, um, more workplace violence um, requirements based on its process. The hospital reports and investigates the following safety and security incidents involving patients, staff, or others within its facilities, including those related to workplace violence. 
And then there's other EP changes and revisions. Um, you know, there, there's always um, every, we release our accredi accreditation manuals twice a year in July and January. There, there have been grammatical or conditions of participation cross-reference changes to other EPs, uh, but these have not created a change in the requirement. Um, the way you'll know uh, what our changes are in our manuals at the beginning of our accreditation manual, there's a section called what's new. You all, that's where I go right to, what's new? What do I need to know? So find the what's new section. And then also in, uh, the, in the chapters where the standards are, we will highlight any changes as well for you uh, so that they jump out at you as well. But um, just so you know, whenever there is a standard EP edition, the Joint Commission will provide six months notice. This is communicated in one of our publications. So, you know, make sure you're getting perspectives and EC news and will be displayed in the pre-publication standards on our website. Um, they can be viewed through e-edition. Make sure you, you know how to get the e-edition on your, uh, we call it your extranet site. This is always a popular, um, um, subject in our presentations. It's the top physical environment observations. Now this data is from 2021. Uh, we're closing out 2022 here, so we'll be updating this data. But all of you like me have been in the industry a long time. We all know that um, the top 10 doesn't really change. They move around. Um, some go up, some go down, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of the same stuff. But th what this shows you is on the left-hand side in the blue, uh, it shows you from top down the most frequently scored standards and EPs. And then on the right-hand side, it gives you those observations on the safer matrix um, based on risk. So um, now if you see here, this is what I'm gonna show you is, I'm not gonna go through all top, um, top 10. I'm going to go through the top five and start from LS2135 EP4. And so this is everybody's favorite observation, right? And I say that with my tongue in my cheek because it's, you know, it's so challenging to keep stuff off of sprinkler pipes above our ceilings. Um, you know, you know, typically what we see is, uh, you know, data cables suspended on sprinkler pipes. Um, you know, CMS is very strict about nothing on sprinkler pipes. Um, some of our surveyors are, are more lenient. Um, we try to be very consistent. That's our number one approach is consistency. Um, but um, there is some flexibility in the field. But the solution is, you know, doing, doing our best to develop an above ceiling um, program uh, with the contractors, with security, with IT, um, but auditing the work. Um, obviously, we're going to conduct our periodic building inspections ourselves, but, you know, some of the best organizations, the way they do it is they hardwire their above ceiling program into purchasing so that, you know, if, you know, they won't, they won't sign off on an invoice until that technician has done the uh, above ceiling inspection. And to make sure that the contractors are, are doing, um, you know, repairing any barriers that they're going through or making sure that we're not uh, supporting anything on our sprinkler pipes. So the number four on the list would be EC255 EP6, um, hospital inspects, tests, and maintains the following. This is, this is your non high risk utility system components. Typical observation is um, open electrical junction boxes, um, exceeding maintenance interval for utility components. Um, you know, this is the typical, again, it's a lot of the same periodic rounds to survey environment to address issues, proactively uh, utilize automated system for maintenance scheduling. So those are some solutions uh, for that standard in EP. EC, uh, this is number three. EC221 EP5, hospital minimizes risk associated with selecting, handling, and storing, transporting, using, and disposing hazardous chemicals. Um, 
eyewash stations, probably the most frequently scored deficiency uh, at EP5 is the eyewash station. So, you know, um, you know, making sure that you have weekly checks of your eyewash station. And I would also say, you know, do a risk assessment. And um, I was at a hospital last week here. I live in North Carolina. I'm, I'm doing this presentation. I live near Wilmington, North Carolina on the Atlantic coast. You guys are all in the Pacific area. And uh, I was at a hospital in North Carolina this past week and they had eyewash stations everywhere. When you start talking to them about, you know, do we really need them? What, what chemicals or what risk do we have in the environment? And when we started drilling down on that, you know, they quickly realized that, you know, there was a lot of eyewash stations that they really just didn't need, you know? So that's another thing to take a look at. EC261 EP1, this is, uh, this is what we call a catch-all EP, like, you know, like a lump it into, a, if you don't have an EP, specific EP, it's interior spaces meet the needs of the patient population are safe and suitable. For the care. This is where, you know, water stained ceiling tile, vinyl floors with holes or tears, uh, those kind of things are going to go into that safe environment uh, element of performance. So it really just comes down to, again, you know, walking around, getting your staff, getting the entire hospital staff uh, engaged and having them be your eyes uh, out on the floors and reporting items to the maintenance department, that will help out greatly um, there. And then finally, EC251, EP9, the hospital labels utility system controls to facilitate partial and complete emergency shutdowns. Um, pretty much the number one observation at that EP is unlabeled or mislabeled electrical circuit breakers. Um, electrical circuit breaker for the fire alarm, uh, not marked in red. That's not very common anymore. You guys have gotten that um, under control, but you know, labeling breakers or um, you know, not labeling. Maybe it says it's a spare, but it's on, and because the electrician is now using that spare breaker, but they didn't open uh, update the legend. Uh, that would be another example, but. Another thing I could tell you about, uh, about the hospital labels, utility system controls, you know, think about, you know, um, you know, your chilled water system or your condenser water system or your steam system, of course, your electrical systems or your medical gas systems. You know, when you walk through those facilities, how is your labeling? You know, do you have your, do you have a, a robust valve labeling program at your organization so that in the event you have an emergency, you can isolate that part of the system or the building. So we're not really um, uh, scoring that a lot. We're, we're doing a lot of that educationally. So I'm kind of giving you a heads up to go back to your facility and see how well you're doing labeling your utility system controls. Uh, in the event that there's a, an emergency. All right, well, we're at the end of my formal presentation. So at this time, I'm going to ask that we open it up for questions and answers. All right, if we have any questions, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, if we have any questions here, uh, we have a microphone uh, to go around. Uh, just raise a hand and we'll get a microphone over to you. Yeah, and why we're getting folks geared up. I liked what Dave said earlier. Of, hey, I can't see you, you can't see me. Um, I only know a few people's, uh, uh, who they are by their voice, like Dave. Um, so, you know, and no question, honestly, I know it's a, it can be a cliche, but no question is a dumb question. We're all here to learn. We're always learning. And if I don't know the answer, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to get, get you the answer uh, through my contacts at CC. Okay, so Tim, we have a, a room that's kind of a little shy right now. So I'll go ahead and get started. And uh, while we have one hand up. Um, so in, uh, in speaking of LS020135 and the, uh, the piping, um, it seems like I, I'm sure some of us have seen, I'll use the term maybe overzealous surveyors in the past with, it says, uh, speaks to suspended from pipe 
or uh, supported by pipe. And, we're, I, and I think of cabling that might be touching. Are, are you seeing any more um, uh, leniency or just consistency from surveyors on that uh, over the past years? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think what, you know, what we're trying to do, and I think the field, you guys in the field are, are, have really gotten this under control, uh, even though it's in the top five or number five on the most frequently scored, right? I mean, still on that list. I remember when it was top one or two, right? So, you know, I think what the surveyors are doing is, is you know, um, you know, CMS or other, other folks might, you know, if it's, if the cable is, you know, laying on the pipe, it's being, the pipe is supporting it. You know, what we're scoring nowadays is because everybody's got a lot of stuff off the pipes. Uh, you know, I, I, that hospital I was at last week, they had a sprinkler pipe, a sprinkler pipe underneath duct work and the sprinkler pipe was actually insulated with the duct work. So it's, it's stuff like that, you know, where it's, it's obvious that we got a problem here. All right. Thank you. Our next question here. You know, we, we got guys, you know, you know, they, they want to do the right thing, the surveyors too. And, you know, um, they will take the time to really, you know, like the duct work, the duct, duct work sitting on sprinkler pipes, you know, they, they're going to make sure that, you know, if they can get, you know, a piece of paper through there or they can see through there, they're not going to score that, but they're going to take the time to make sure they're not going to just um, write it up and not, not investigate it. Thank you. Okay, my question is about the water management program, Joint Commission and uh, CMS uh, do not allow, or, or say you do not do Legionella testing, but if you do do Legionella testing periodically and the surveyor asks you for the report, do you have to give it to them? Well, we don't, you know, again, we don't require testing. Um, so if a surveyor asks, you know, the surveyor should say, ask you what, how are you monitoring for waterborne pathogens that should be in your plan. Um, if they specifically ask to see for testing, well, I mean, I've heard lots of customers say, well, we're not required to do testing. Um, but a lot of organizations will provide it. And at that point, what they're going to be looking for is, okay, you did the testing, you know, what, what. What did, what did you learn from the testing? What are you doing about the situation? It's more about, you know, what's next after the testing because we don't require the testing, right? So it's, it's more about, you know, what are you doing um, to, to resolve it? Thank you. Hi, I have a question for maintenance that is required. Any type in general could be utility system, fire systems. During the pandemic, we had times where vendors, for whatever reason, weren't able to perform it within the required time frame. Now, it was completed eventually, but maybe not in the required time frame. How do we handle that? We know we've, you know, we, we've identified it. We were able to correct it. But now, you know, say we get surveyed, you know, in, in the coming months, someone will look back and see, oh, you missed this, you missed that. I mean, we have documentation, but we still didn't do it. How is that viewed? That's an excellent question um, because we are still in the public health emergency. It was just actually extended um, a few days ago, all the way through, I think, till into January. So we're still in a, under a public health emergency. That means the 1135 waivers are still in place. Uh, my surveyor should ask you, if you've uh, accepted or adopted any of the 1135 waivers that relate to inspection, testing, and maintenance, that's part of our survey process. They should ask you that before um, they start document review. If they don't, tell them. Say, hey, just a heads up before you get into this, um, you know, we got these 11, 1135 waivers in place, and these are the ones we've adopted. Um, you know, I just want to make you aware of that. And so, yes, you can, you're still able to use those waivers. Now make sure that you know there's a few things you can't wave out, you know, generator and ATS testing and um, elevator recall. There's, you know, there's a, a small list of things you can't wave, but a majority, a majority of it you can. Now I'll share across the country. You know, if you were to ask me what's normal, what's what's going on across most organizations, 
um, I'm, I mean, when I say most, I'm almost all have continued doing all the inspection, testing and maintenance that they would have done before the pandemic. Um, it, it's actually surprised us. We thought more people would use the waivers. All right, thank you. Next question. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding uh, after hours um, fire drills. And basically there was a clarification that was made a while ago that, um, that separated the visual from the audible signals. And if it was said that if you are basically, if you cannot um, test them uh, separately, then you're gonna have to go ahead and, and it, have your full drills at night. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, I assume that that was because we were trying to have patients be able to sleep all night, but right now when you're in a facility where you cannot separate there, you cannot silence those, we're having to run those at night. Is that going to be, we're going to continue that moving forward? Yeah, unfortunately, that's, that, that's true. Um, if you, if you can't separate the audio and visuals, um, you know, and the other thing to keep in mind too, is that um, offsite notification, but uh, yeah, that's, that's where we're at still. And I don't, I would, I would share with you if I knew there was any changes coming down the road, but there's not. Thank you. We have our next question. Hello, my name is Angel. We just got surveyed by the Joint Commission in July. And uh, one of the areas the surveyor was focused on was roof access from stairwells. Is that gonna be a primary focus coming forward? I was able to talk them out of it because of my local AHJ. I just want to know. Are you, when you say roof access, do you mean like access from like patients and, and, and visitors to the roof? Yeah, great clarification question. It was actually a roof hatch in a stairwell that, that led you out onto the stairwell rooftop. Yeah, you know, um, I would, your, your question was, is that going to be a focus of the, you know, primary focus or a focus of the survey? I don't, I wouldn't, no, it's not a focus, um, but, you know, we do start our billing tour typically on the roof, right? And so it's, it's part of our survey process, but it's not, you know, like on a, you know, on a checklist, um, you know, per se. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question coming here. So I wanted to go back to Pete's question on the water management. Um, so if we're not supposed to, or we're, it's not a requirement to submit, uh, the testing, but you do, um, there's CMS and CDPH and so forth and CDC guidance. How does joint commission work through that? If let's say you provide the testing, you're below the 10 CFUs and you're constantly trying to drop those levels down with via filtration, chlorination, whatever it may be. Um, what is your approach um, in that regards when CDPH, CDC, CMS may have different standards and you're trying to align to those? Well, they don't require testing. Um, so I'm talking about CMS. Um, I, I can't speak to the others, but so when you say um, they have different standards or requirements, what specifically is different between CMS and Joint Commission regarding testing? So what I'm saying is, yeah, it's not required, but let's say we produce it yes. and the CFUs are, let's say at 10 or nine, um, and we have a plan, we're testing, we're trying to get it down, but age of the building, whatever it may be, is not allowing that to drop lower and lower and lower. Um, CMS and CDPH have been somewhat stringent in wanting, you know, more um, of a, uh, an action plan or, a, or more probably more aggressive management, but my, I guess my concern is what would be the expectation from joint commission if that were to occur? Well, I think it would be um, similar in the fact that in the sense that, you know, we would expect to see, okay, you're testing, you're monitoring it, 
you, I'm, you know, I guess I'm assuming that the organization would have an action plan that they are, you know, activating or, you know, um, working on that action plan to make progress. And um, if we see that, you know, we typically accept that. It's the organizations that test and, you know, they, you know, their consultants or their labs, you know, identify a problem and nobody's doing anything about it. That's, that's a problem. Thank you. We have our next question. Is it me? Sorry, there's only one mic. Thank you. So I, I don't quite understand the difference um, in monitoring temperature, pH, chlorine level or disinfecting level and Legionella when it comes to the survey. So it sounds like dancing around it, but um, I don't think that, I've, well, I've never heard of CMS or a surveyor from the Joint Commission or anybody care about the CFU per mil of a Legionella test, nor do they care about the actual temperature itself or chlorine. It's, are you following the plan? Are you implementing your corrective actions and is it working, right? So I, I don't see the difference I would agree with most of what you're saying. I mean, we we leave it up to you to and your professionals that, that you work with, because a lot of times people are organizations are working with water professionals. You know, most of us aren't. That's not our field of expertise. Uh, and so we we um, require you to de to to develop, you know, what you're going to monitor, what your ranges are going to be when you're out of ranges. What is your action plan? Um, and that you're documenting all that. So we don't have we don't have specific, we don't tell you what to monitor or what the ranges are. Thanks. So what I'm hearing is, and I'm not a healthcare, I'm a, one of the water guys. Um, so, but what I'm hearing is you shouldn't be afraid to show your information, your testing, whatever your monitoring is, because that is what your plan is. And you're not gonna be held accountable for the number, whether it's chlorine or a Legionella test, you're held accountable for following and implementing your plan, which is the corrective actions, things like that, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, you you know, we say we're not going to be held accountable to the number. If you you if you create a range, we're going to hold you accountable to be in that range and documenting the you know what your values are. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're saying the same thing, but you know, we rely on you guys. You're the one of the water professionals to help a hospital develop this plan, monitor these items and document corrective actions. Okay, any more questions? Egress, pressure relationships, construction, PICRA, uh, <laughs> trust. Any more questions? Any, I mean, you have the opportunity, joint commission uh, session, You've got a little bit more time. You know what I, why, why they're thinking their questions? One of the things I should have done here is I don't know if I could do it on the fly, but um, let me give everybody my email address. It's really easy. It's my first initial T for Tim, tmarkajohn at jointcommission.org. And, um, you know, I think, I think those in the room that know me um, will tell you that, um, you know, I'm your partner. We're in a joint commission is in the service industry. You're our customer. And uh, we're not out here to get you in trouble or catch you doing something wrong. We're here to support you and help you. And that's the God honest truth. So please reach out to me at tmarkajohn at jointcommission.org. And if I can't get you the answer, I work with the best in the industry. We'll, we'll get you the answer you need. Oh, boy, Tim, now you did it. A lot of people are writing here. Yeah, I'm, hey. I'm, I'm, hey, that's what it's all about. Do you have a home address while you're at it? <laughs> Oh, they want to send me Christmas cards, right? <laughs> All right. With no other questions, Tim, thank you very much. Very appreciated. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank, thank, you, thank you for you. inviting me. All right. Um, everybody, we have a, uh, we're on a little break. Our next presentation starts at 315. It's the last one of the day, unless you're taking the MEC test. I hope you're studying if you are. All right. You can get up. <laughs>